Changing Perspectives, Reflections on the Self and the United Nations. All of us are born in an orbit. This includes not only individuals, but also institutions and countries. Our mindsets, culture and attitudes color our behavior, which affects the way we live, what we do and what we become. In each person's life or history of the world comes a moment when you can ask different questions, get a different view, or discover another perspective which allows a chance to change purpose, direction, or simply imagine infinite possibilities. Redefining perspectives can make a difference, a huge difference. It can change lives, transform institutions, and even change the course of the world. Redefinition is the front burner of progress. Let me share some personal examples on how changing perspectives led me to the United Nations, my personal story, and how the organization itself is a chi child of changing circum circumstance. As a youth, I was quite dull. Almost last in class, that is class eight. I used to daydream a lot. The age of counseling and IQ tests had just begun. My IQ turned out to be 57, the IQ of an idiot. I was called and told to choose my track. Science was out, social studies, the only option. I was asked what I wanted to do, but I had no clue what I wanted. There was a vague sense that I did, did not want to work in a factory. That's what engineers do. Blood I could not stand, so medicine was out. About law, I had no idea. Money, power, skills meant nothing to me. But the world fascinated me. The world was all about cricket, pretty girls, incredible ice creams, and beautiful places that I enjoyed through the National Geographic. I went home and told my father that the school wanted to meet him about my future and gave him my report. Without looking at the report, he said, ask them to go to hell. They will not decide what you will do. You will decide what you want to do. I have no time for this nonsense. This was a defining moment. My father taught me to have confidence and trust myself and not rely on scores, coaching classes or assessments of others. It opened my mind to believe in myself. My discovery of what I wanted to do in life came through my English teacher in high school. She would come to class and have us write short or long essays. If winter is here, can spring be far behind? In praise of walking, wherever dark clouds loom, the United Nations is empowered to resolve the crisis. Discuss. She asked us to research this project in the libraries of Mumbai and write a 10-page paper. While researching the paper, I learned about the United Nations. As the newest social innovation, defying history, using military means to prevent conflict and transcend nonviolence and separate the forces wherever they were fighting of different countries in the world. While, uh, so, this innovation in which the UN began to defy the thought process of history whose purpose was to prevent a major war, just as it uh, had happened in World War II, was to prevent major wars and bring countries together to end discrimination, assist refugees, fight disease and hunger across the world. This was quite a turn for humankind, a major shift in consciousness. For thousands of years, humans had fought each other for territory, control of resources and dominance. Now the world was cooperating to provide each other. Hunger was thought to be natural and beyond the control of man. Now under the UN, the objective was to eliminate hunger. For the first time, hunger in Africa became a concern for an American. And the Arab-Israeli conflict is really a conflict that came to the attention of the international world. It led me to ask, can I work for the UN? 
The idea of working for peace across the world and for citizens from all countries was seeded in my consciousness. Slowly but surely, narrow ideas of Mera Desh Mahan, my country right or wrong, corrosive nationalism were replaced by a sense that the whole world was mine. To celebrate the entire planet and feel at home everywhere. This perspective was further enhanced when the first satellite pictures of Earth were transmitted from outer space, where one saw a borderless planet, giving all a chance to reflect that we were not different, less or more, but part of a larger energy in the story of life. Now the question arose, how do I get to the UN? I was studying physics, but my direction was moving towards international diplomacy. I had no idea how to make the shift. At the time, an elderly uncle made a remark, and my soul heard him, and it remained in my mind. Be the best you can, and read, and read, and read. Travel by yourself to everything. Those words were profound, and I took them literally, and read profusely across the social sciences, sciences, and the humanities. Fiction, non-fiction, biographies, history, geographies, economics, astronomy, histories of science, law, politics, philosophy, management sciences, poetry, international relations, almost anything, including pornography. I also started traveling to the corners of India. It was like crossing, cross-training the mind. The same way as you cross-train, we cross-train our bodies in the gym. I got the courage to take the UPSC exams for the foreign service, to which I did not qualify, but did so for the civil services. I worked there for a few years, but the urge to get closer to the UN remained. The failure to get into the foreign service led me to seek admission to the finest graduate school for the study of international law and diplomacy in Boston. Remember, when you fail, don't seek a lower goal seek a higher aim. The years of reading and work with government helped me to qualify. Here I studied all I could about global organizations and policy. Soon I found myself at the World Bank, then teaching about the UN at the university, working with Greenpeace on ecology, and finally at the United Nations doing peacekeeping in the former Yugoslavia, redefining myself with each move. Now I see the full jigsaw puzzle coming together. Moments and people who pressed or nudged me in alternative directions to believe in yourself even when possibilities seemed remote. To discover through research, to understand horizons beyond today by reading and traveling, enabling me to redefine, recalibrate. But for this to happen, you have to keep your third eye open. The source of redefinition can be anyone, anything, a friend, a stranger, God, a child, a stray remark. Redefinition of perspectives can happen by accident, as it happened to Newton while sitting under a tree when an apple fell on him, leading him to discover the laws of gravity. Darwin redefined our origins through evolution by close observation and travel, as did Copernicus who showed how the sun was the center of our solar system and not the earth. In ancient times, the discovery that the earth was not flat, but round, revolutionized travel and movement of people and goods. In astronomy and religion, perspectives remain contested on whether the universe emerged through the Big Bang or an act of creation. Perspectives and paradigms shift, change, and are constantly in motion. You are never static. Thomas Kuhn in his Structure of Scientific Revolutions, a book you must all read, particularly because you are in an engineering college, discussed that change was a product of asking questions. The more questions you asked of a particular theory or a hypothesis and challenged existing notions, the greater the chances that you would discover different ways of doing things. Karl Marx and Engels did the same in the social sciences. They gave the world the dialectical method to view history by framing current understandings as a thesis. 
to be questioned and opposed by opposite understanding as an antithesis, which could result in a new appreciation of reality through a synthesis. Thus, knowledge and action, or observation and participation, are related in defining a view or a, a point of view. A lesson derived from the Heisenberg uncertainty principle in physics, which, which you, most of you must, might be familiar. Returning to the United Nations, my work there was exciting to say the least, both in the field and headquarters. Constantly challenged on matters of war and peace, humanitarian issues, and the environment and development. Perspectives and approaches were under constant scrutiny. Should the UN use force in its military operations? How much force should be used to protect peacekeepers or civilians trapped by militias and faced with atrocities? Should the UN be a vehicle for correcting humanitarian wrongs and undermine the sovereignty of member states? Can it ignore human rights of can it ignore human rights in one part of the world and enforce these in other parts? Is the eradication of poverty more urgent than the abatement of pollution and the environment? What is terror? Can a state be defined as a terrorist? My work took me to the conflict zones in peace operations on different continents. The intensive care unit of humanity, where the purpose is to stop conflict, the original purpose of the UN, and stabilize situations, and re-enable broken and failed states, the growing role of the United Nations. These objectives could be barely envisaged or thought about a hundred years ago. Political philosophers had written about international governance since the 17th century, and today in peace and security matters, it is a reality. The UN has over 100 military and police battalions plus diplomatic staff in missions across the globe. As we see, in human and international relations, progress has resulted through a constant redefinition of perspective, purpose, and problems. The notion that kingship was permanent was replaced by the idea of democracy and rule of law, that power was vested in people jointly held in a republic under a constitution, now implicit in several UN mandates and countries. The idea of sovereignty, a country having full control over its territory and people, is now being interrogated and questioned by the doctrine of responsibility to protect. If a country cannot feed its people or protect them, should humanitarian intervention from the international community through global action take place is a deep question that is raised in the narrative and discourse of modern intervention. Long ago, movement once states emerged, movement came to be regulated. Now that power to regulate is being questioned once again to allow the free movement of persons across borders, particularly for people pushed by distress, refugees and political migrants. This is yet another perspective being grappled at the UN and the International Migration Organization on how to manage millions who are displaced from their homes by war, hunger, and natural disasters. A core question that the world will have to grapple in the coming decades is the rise of new actors competing with the modern state in a globalizing world. Are the new multinational corporations, the Amazons, Googles, and Apples of the world going to replace states as their power expands? What role for the United Nations in regulating such changes? Is allegiance of national citizens to their states going to decline and the world become more cosmopolitan and less nationalistic? Or will technology and fake news create new ghettos of the mind of an inward-looking international society with populations lost in the darkness of virtual reality? Will we become global citizens or remain chained to local interests and our personal paranoia. The EU Brexit saga is a case in point. In other words, the world is not constant. As I've said earlier, redefinition is and our perspectives are in churn. 
Sometimes your perspectives come full circle. As a child, when my parents would quarrel, I would tell them that only if all of us were highly educated and lived in beautiful places, we would fight less. I, were, I would plead that we leave Bombay and go to the Himalayas. I had this notion that education and beauty would enable peace. Many years later, I found myself with the United Nations doing peacekeeping in the former Yugoslavia where I spent nine years. It is a stunning place. The entire country, a Kashmir hundred times over. Its people were and are one of the most educated and sophisticated in the world. Yet the country fell apart in the early 90s in a fierce civil war. The fighting there was not carried out by peasants and workers, but a relatively well-placed middle class, including doctors, lawyers and engineers who carried out massacres, only in the 90s. The Srebrenica massacre in Bosnia, the killings of Kosovo in Serbia, and the fighting in Vukova, Croatia was horrendous. It took place not far from some of the most civilized places of the world, only a few hundred kilometers away, where the Enlightenment, Renaissance, and Reformist Europe had been born and grown. Venice, Vienna, Budapest. Massacres happen not only in Africa. Some of the largest atrocities have occurred in Europe against the Jews and the Japanese by the Americans. All beautiful and well-schooled. I learned that civility is a thin veneer which barely covers the animal within us. It can crack any time. Think Godra, think 1984, the massacre of the Sikhs in our own country. If we do not guard against our instincts, we can destroy each other in a flash and return to a primitive existence in a moment, no matter how educated and beautiful we might be. Nuclear weapons could do that in an instant. In many ways, the UN has been a platform for redefining the world. Think of the outlawing of war and violence under the UN Charter. Think sustainable development goals. Think climate change. These perspectives were unthinkable some generations ago. Now we take them for granted. So today, the world what does it teach us based on this historical experience? It teaches and warns us that progress is reversible. It is not linear and moving in one direction. Nothing is absolute, neither greatness, prosperity, or power. Seek to be zero. When you are zero, you can be anything. You can redefine yourself and become infinity. Thank you.